Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's webinar on the Netherlands dig Digitalization Solutions Fit for the Future and its role as Gateway to Europe. It is my pleasure to um, inform you of some housekeeping rules. For the participants who are joining us in this webinar, thank you very much for your presence. But please note that the webinar will be recorded. We encourage you also to put up your questions to the speakers and you can do so via your screen below. Okay. So without any further delay, allow me to now invite Mr. Douglas Fu, President of the Singapore Manufacturing Federation to give his welcome address. Mr. Fu, please. Thank you, Emily. Her Excellency, Masi Fono, Ambassador to the Kingdom of Netherlands to Singapore. Distinguished speakers, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good day to all. I'm honored to be here today in my capacity as the President of Singapore Manufacturing Federation, or SMF for short, to give the welcome address at this webinar, which is jointly organized by the SMF together with one of the services, Enterprise Europe Network, or EEN, Singapore, as well as the Royal Netherlands Embassy in Singapore and the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency. To begin, allow me to extend my gratitude to Her Excellency, Ambassador Masid Fono, for gracing us with her presence at today's webinar. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. Your presence here today is a clear reflection of the excellent relations between Singapore and Netherlands, and more importantly, of the close friendship with SMF has built with you and your embassy as a result of your commitment of support to SMF. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your support and friendship. Let me begin by providing a brief introduction of the SMF. The SMF was established in 1932, and we are one of the oldest trade federations in Singapore. Currently, we have over 5,000 member companies comprising MNCs, SMEs, and local companies in Singapore. SMF member companies represent the entire spectrum of industries of Singapore's manufacturing sector, including electrical and electronics, ICT, building products and construction materials, energy and chemicals, food and beverages, medical technology, pharmaceuticals, machinery and engineering, and other clusters of Singapore's manufacturing ecosystem. As the advocate for the Singapore manufacturing community, SMF seeks to further the manufacturing sector's growth and facilitate its competitiveness and sustainability. In this regard, the SMF regularly organizes activities such as industry-led webinars, networking events, ministry dialogue sessions, workshops, local and overseas exhibitions, along with offering a host of comprehensive and focused services that benefit our members and by extension, the manufacturing community in Singapore. Besides organizing various activities for our members, SMF has always been proactive in encouraging our member enterprise to look beyond the Singapore market and seek new business opportunities in investments and partnerships overseas, particularly in the EU countries through the SMF Enterprise Europe Network Singapore office. Since its launch in 2015, the SMF's EEN Singapore has been creating opportunities for Singapore companies to expand their business to Europe for investments and trade, as well as to set up new supply chains through various customized and cluster business matching with companies in Europe. It is my pleasure to report that since its inception in 2015, SMF EEN Singapore office has held over 5,000 EU Singapore EEN brokerage meetings and organized more than 80 EEN brokerage events. It also has more than 2,000 Singapore companies in its database with some 2,400 expressions of interest from European companies, including from Netherlands. EEN Singapore has also succeeded to facilitate over 100 partnership agreements signed between Singapore and European companies, mainly which are Netherlands enterprises in the areas of collaboration in business, innovation, digitalization and technology. Without doubt, Netherlands is one of the leading countries in EU where our Singapore enterprises will like to invest and connect to do business in EU. 
Since the implementation of safety restrictions due to COVID-19, SMF and EEN Singapore have shifted most of activities onto the online sphere, hosting cross-border webinars and online industry-based business matching sessions between Singapore and EU companies. A successful online event that EEN Singapore organized was a technological pitching and business matching session between the Dutch and Singaporean companies to promote Singapore companies to collaborate with Netherlands companies in partnerships relating to innovations and technologies. These are areas where Dutch companies are renowned for, and I'm happy to know that today's webinar will be leveraging on Netherlands expertise in the areas of digitalization, innovations, and technologies. Going forward, the EEN Singapore will continue in our efforts to encourage our Singapore enterprises, especially the SMEs, to collaborate in the areas of innovation with EU companies, particularly those from Netherlands. Allow me now to share with you on a passionate subject of mine, namely the Singapore's manufacturing landscape. Even though Singapore has limited land mass to build industrial plants, it has a robust manufacturing sector that contributes about 21% or around 106 billion Singapore dollars of Singapore's total GDP. Our manufacturing sector is one of the few exceptions together with Japan, Korea, and Germany. It has maintained or grown the sector to contribute one fifth of our nation's GDP during the challenging COVID-19 period last year. Against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, Singapore's manufacturing sector has remained surprisingly resilient and continues to report positive growth, with manufacturing output increasing by 7.3% last year. In fact, in a recent monthly manufacturing performance report, Singapore manufacturing output increased 11.2% on a year-on-year -year basis, with most of the clusters, namely precision engineering, transport engineering, general manufacturing, chemicals, electronics, recording output growth. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic has emphasized the importance of digital and technological transformation in enabling companies to overcome the economic challenges arising from COVID-19 pandemic. To accelerate and beef up economic transformation, the Singapore government has announced a 10-year plan earlier this year, which aims to make Singapore a global business, innovation, and talent hub for advanced manufacturing. Specifically, the plan calls for Singapore's manufacturing sector to grow by 50% within the next 10 years. With this 10-year plan, Singapore's manufacturing sector is poised to become even more dynamic with an educated and readily skilled workforce and nurturing more resilient and agile manufacturing enterprises. As a partner in Singapore's nation building, the SMF is proud to participate and play the role of capitalists to help Singapore's manufacturing sector to achieve the target set in the 10-year plan. Netherlands and Singapore have long-standing economic ties, having established diplomatic relations soon after our independence in 1965. We have much in common, as we both have thriving, open economies and key gateways to the regions we serve. One noteworthy mention is the Netherlands' position as the fourth largest investor in Singapore's foreign direct investment stock in 2019. In turn, Singapore has invested more than 18 billion in the Netherlands. Singapore and Netherlands are also partners in the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, or EUSFTA, which is a mega free trade agreement that is already in force and which will improve market access for both nations. It is noteworthy to know that even before the establishment of the EU SFTA, there are nearly 3,000 Dutch companies that have exported several goods and services to Singapore. With the implementation of EU SFTA, I am certain that economic ties between Netherlands and Singapore will be further strengthened and enhanced for both nations. Indeed, it is my honor and pleasure to be at this webinar, which I believe will provide insights into the opportunities for Singapore companies to strengthen business partnerships with Netherlands enterprises and to grow together for the EU and the ASEAN markets. Such collaborations will facilitate better management of talents, resources, capital, and enable Netherlands and Singapore enterprises to ride on each other's advantages, as well as learn from each other's experience and knowledge to grow the global markets. I'm confident that today's webinar will be the start of closer and better relations 
between Netherlands and Singapore at enterprises and people-to-people -people level. I assure Ambassador, as well as our core organizers and all of you present here today, that the Singapore Manufacturing Federation is committed to help to build closer bilateral business relations between our two countries and to continue to engage with partners and stakeholders to facilitate Netherlands and Singapore enterprises to do business together. If SMF can be of service to you, please do not hesitate to contact our team at SMF. My sincere gratitude goes out to Ambassador Masip Fono and her team in the Royal Netherlands Embassy, as well as to all co-organizers and to the distinguished speakers for their support and collaboration for this webinar. Stay healthy and well. Thank you very much. Emeline, you're muted. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Fu. It is now my pleasure to invite uh, Her Excellency Margaret Bono, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Netherlands to Singapore, to come and give her opening address. Indeed, the organizers, especially the Singapore Manufacturing Federation, we are very grateful that Ambassador has taken her time her busy, from her busy schedule to come and give her sharing on how Singapore Netherlands can further work together. Ambassador, please. Thank you, Emmeline. Mr. Douglas Fu, President of the Singapore Manufacturing Association. I'm really happy that I can join you here this afternoon. And I do have more time actually, since um, I was able together with some friends and allies to secure the vaccinated travel lane for the Netherlands. So I hope you as businesses will reap the benefits of that and fly in and out with your engineers uh, from next week onwards, because that's what I told EDB was one of the reasons that we wanted to stay connected. And uh, Mr. Fu, congratulations on your re-election as president of SMF. We are very pleased ourselves that we can continue working with you and with your excellent team, because in the end, it's all about people. And I'm also very pleased that I have three representatives of three companies that I know quite well and I'm very impressed with, who will later give you more details about their work on digitization, digital twins, uh, a lot of digital solutions. But before we go so, and I would like to thank uh, Adeline Tan uh, the, from the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, who also could attract a lot of Singaporeans to actually live in the Netherlands and not just work with the Netherlands like on this webinar. We have lots to offer. But I'd like to go back in time to Mr. Albert Winsemius. Mr. Albert Winsemius was a well-known advisor to Singapore. Uh, we will have a book about his life published beginning of next year, and I'm really looking forward to it because I think he deserves a book about his life and what he's done for Singapore and the Netherlands. But there's a quote of him that I think is very apt in this time of the pandemic era where we live in. He once told an audience of Singaporeans, you are the one-eyed people. And he explained, actually, you maybe feel like you're living in times where everybody feels blind. You're insecure. You don't know what's happening. You don't have all the facts and data at hand. But this is the new normal. That was in the 60s, what he told. But I think it's now even more of a new normal. So he urged everybody just with one eye, even if you're squeezing a little bit, just enter the next phase because then you have a competitive edge. And I think that's very, very apt to use that here in these times where we have a lot of insecurity, but we also see a lot of opportunities, especially in this digital era. And I know that the Netherlands and Singapore work quite well together also on the business side, although we're 10,000 kilometers apart, there's something in the way we think we do business which makes it easy. Maybe it's because we, we both like good food, we, we have meetings in restaurants, then we go and sit one-on-one -on -one and we're both very honest. We say no when we mean we, we don't like it, but we also go with solutions. 
And I think that's one of the reasons that Singapore sees the Netherlands as the gateway to Europe. It's not just our connectivity with the harbour, with Schiphol Airport. It's also the connectivity of mines. Maybe that's one of the reasons that currently in Dubai at the World Expo, Singapore and the Netherlands are actual neighbours, not 10,000 kilometres apart, but really right next to each other. And we planned it that way. Why? Because both our pavilions are geared towards the future, towards innovation, towards digital skills, also towards sustainability and finding new solutions together. And I think it's a very strong message where we see that the world is checking Singapore next to the Netherlands and see that there's so much combined in both countries. And what I like being an ambassador here, also on the business side, that it's a win-win for parties involved. It's not just one party wagging the little finger or another one insecure and one who has all the data. I think that's the strength what we're doing here now. We try to get people together and have mutual profits. I really believe it's the win-win that we are aiming for because we are here for the long haul. The Dutch have been in Singapore for a very, very long time. We were, like uh, the president said, one of the first to recognize Singapore. And actually, it was a very wise decision. That's why I live in a residence, which is a very good investment because we bought it in 1947. We recognized Singapore in 1965. And we've been here ever since, growing our friendship, growing our investments and growing the opportunities. So let me stop here because I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the companies and I'm sure that this will be the start of new connectivity and new endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, we appreciate your coming here to give us the opening address. Right now, let me uh, start by inviting the specialist expert to now come and speak on this subject of digitalization. First and foremost, may I invite Mr. Peter Stolet, Vice President of APEC uh, District Con Solutions, to come and talk about this supply chain challenges in the manufacturing uh, scenario. And as we all know, because of COVID, many of the manufacturing supply chains that our investors have put in worldwide have been disrupted. So let's hear from um, Peter on his solutions. Peter, please. Thank you, Emelyn, for the introduction. Um, it's great. It's great to be here. Thanks all for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Douglas Fu, for sketching the broader manufacturing landscape of Singapore. And also thank you, Ambassador, for, for, the, uh, for the nice words and the, all the hard work you and the Embassy have been doing in the last, uh, last weeks and months to, um, well, to arrange for Dutch people to, to go to Europe, to go to the home country, uh, to see family and friends, but also to allow, allow our colleagues uh, based in the Netherlands to come to Singapore to support in the, in the current projects because um, yeah, having, we can do all the things virtual, but um, we also very much appreciate and we, um, yeah, we know the value of having a face-to-face -face conversation. So um, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, um, I will try to share, to share some screens and we have quite a, quite a busy agenda um, for today. Um, let me first, okay. Yes, um, so my name is, my name is Peter Stolte and I'm responsible for the business development uh, and project delivery in Asia Pacific uh, for Districon. Um, in the next, in the next 15 minutes, I would like to discuss the current supply chain challenges, uh, the actions to take um, and also how supply chain analytics can help. And furthermore, I also would like to try to show to show three uh, three use cases uh, we've worked on uh, uh, in recent years. So uh, it's a lot in uh, it's a lot in 50 minutes. Um, sometimes it might be that I'm going maybe a bit too fast, but at the end there is a, there is a Q and A session. So 
if there are any questions, please, uh, please then reach out. Um, Districom is a, it's a Dutch, it's a Dutch company. Um, we are a supply chain and logistics consulting firm, uh, providing advisory and uh, software solutions services, which we, uh, which we develop fit for purpose. And we have more than 45 years of experience within the supply chain and logistics industry. Um, with the last 10 years, having a strong focus on using advanced analytics in our projects uh, to help our clients. Um, so our headquarters are in the Netherlands uh, and we have in Singapore an entity now for, uh, for over three years now. And well, for example, recent projects we've done here in Singapore are for the, for the EDB, the Economic Development Board, uh, Changi uh, and SATS. Um, and for many other global, uh, global manufacturing companies, um, being active in food and beverage, uh, heavy industry, uh, but also in the fashion industry. So I think the SMS all, yeah, SMF also, also have like uh, so many clients being active in so many different industries. So hopefully in the next 15 minutes, um, yeah, we can, we can share something of our experience that would, uh, that, that is valuable and interesting. Uh, uh, for for some of you, um, at least that's that's our goal of today. So, when I started um, my working career um, over ten years now, ago as a fresh graduate um, at a supply chain and logistics advisory firm, I could never imagine that one day uh, the news headlines would be dominated by the current challenges we are seeing in these supply chains. Um, almost everything that is vital for delivering a finished product to customers is experiencing shortages, uh, semiconductors, raw materials, uh, shipping containers, uh, we see the port capacities, warehouse spaces, etc., etc. And at the same time, consumers are getting more and more demanding. Um, their request for faster deliveries and their request for more sustainable supply chains. Um, and then, of course, we see, yeah, uh, the shortage of containers and record high container range, uh, rates. We see uh, the rates going from 1500 US dollar. Now, sometimes we see rates of 20,000 US dollar. Um, this is not all, this is not all new, uh, new for you, of course. And we now clearly see the, the ripple effect, well, from manufacturing having uh, short-term uh, short shutdowns caused by the pandemic, uh, causing these shortages and price increases. However, it's not only COVID-19 that is causing these, uh, the recent shortages. I think that it's very good to realize because over the last years, uh, product portfolios and offerings have been, uh, have exploded in size and in complexity. Uh, production and supply networks have become increasingly complex um, external pressures, including uh, regulations, trade barriers, uh, have uh, intensified, um, and multiple stakeholders are demanding a more sustainable, um, yeah, sustainable supply chain and to promote sustainability. Um, and actually, uh, well, the end is not in sight yet, so it's not expected uh, everything will be solved when the pandemic ends. So. Uh, or to solve itself in the next months. It is expected to last, uh, to last for years. So, well, action, action is required and things have to be done. Uh, things have to be done in different, in different way. Um, for years, supply chains uh, have focused on reducing inventory levels um, and cutting costs by embracing a, a lean just-in-time management in their logistics plans. Uh, the US-China trade war and the current, well, uh, supply and demand uh, shocks uh, brought by the, by the pandemic uh, clearly exposed the gaps or weaknesses um, in the production strategies and the supply chains. It forces manufacturers everywhere, uh, small, large, all over the world, in every country, um, uh, to, reassess the, to reassess the supply chains um, in every industry. Um, uh, manufacturers will face pressure of de-risking supply chains or making it more resilient without sacrificing competitiveness. I already heard 
the resilient in Mr. Douglas' uh, uh, introductionary uh, introductionary speech. It's now it's now all over the world. It's all about being resilient, uh, building resilience. Uh, but what do we actually understand under a resilient supply chain? So how we see it that if your supply chain is resilient, uh, your production and distribution systems can continue to function as well as is possible in a destabilizing event. So indeed, uh, a, a key indicator uh, of your operations resilience is the degree to which you can meet your yeah, you can meet your obligations uh, towards your customers uh, despite disruptions by consistently uh, consistently delivering goods and services against your cost, your quality, and your service levels. Um, I've listed here a couple of a couple of actions to take and trends we see to make your supply chain more resilient. And later I will show uh, three use cases how we've helped companies making the first steps in this uh, supply chain resilience journey. The exercise could or maybe, well, maybe even should start with a, a thorough review of your current supply chain capabilities. Uh, this this helps manufacturers understand where vulnerabilities are, um, uh, where they exist, so you can prioritize uh, corrective actions. The trend now we see a lot uh, is that companies are looking uh, how to diversify the supply base uh, in the most optimal way. So having more partners to choose from provides manufacturers with alternative if certain suppliers can deliver due to a uh, due to a disruptive event, for example. Like we are currently see with the uh, with the large lockdown and very strict lockdown in Vietnam, uh, which is really affecting all the fashion uh, all the fashion manufacturers. Um, other approaches include uh, nearshoring uh, to reduce the dependence on complex uh, global logistic systems um, to bring manufacturing for critical components uh, closer by or even uh, or even in house. If alternate suppliers are not immediately available. Um, a company should determine how much extra stock to, stock to hold in the interim period um in what form and where along the the value chain of course safety stock like any inventory right uh it carries yeah with it a risk of uh, um, uh of getting uh, uh obsolete uh, and also ties up uh, ties up cash um it runs counter to the to the traditional popular practice of just-in-time replenishment uh, and lean inventories but the savings uh, for this strategy could really outweigh uh, all the cost of a uh, of a potential disruption. While manufacturers already have made strides uh, since the pandemic, uh, we clearly see there may be um, missing further opportunities to reduce uh, risk within within their supply chains. Um, uh, in a in a recent research, uh, just over 40 40 percent of the respondents. Uh, are less than satisfied uh, or even dissatisfied with the level of transparency the organization had into their supply chain during the pandemic. And there it all starts. If you don't know what's happening, then it's very difficult to make, uh, to make optimal, optimal decisions. So I guess these are just a couple, a couple of actions to take. Uh, uh, to building towards a more resilient supply chain. Um, I guess most of it makes sense and maybe you all, you're already practicing some of them. Um, uh, if not, then all this question, okay, how to start, how to achieve, um, how, to, how to get there? Well, in moving from a more traditional cost-cutting supply chain to a resilient de-risking supply chain, advanced analytics could play a major role. Um, let me first explain what we actually mean by supply chain advanced analytics. Um, well, Gartner, uh, the technology research and consulting company, uh, have made quite a clear overview uh, of the certain types of advanced analytics. Um, I guess most of the people are, are familiar with uh, historical analytics such as um, sales ratios, inventory turnover, number of stockouts, etc. These analytics we, we often call uh, uh, business intelligence. They provide insights into 
past um, into past performance. Uh, it's very important, um, but the information alone is not actionable. What's needed are forward looking analytics, better known as uh, advanced analytics. Um, uh, this allows you to predict uh, what will happen, uh, what will happen with a with a surprising accuracy. Um, they also let you determine and answers to questions such as what are the required stock level needed uh, to to ensure business objectives are met, uh, how to optimize revenue, how to optimize margin, etc. Um, uh, Predictive analytics leverage organizational data to predict future trends. So it's more about it's more about forecasting, and prescriptive analytics um, answers more than what if questions to determine the best optimal supply chain planning decisions. That's also more about scenario planning. So, okay. Um, the fourth form, the most, re the most recent one, uh, added by added by Gartner, um, uh, it's cognitive and artificial intelligence. It's defined as uh, insights and recommendations uh, based on self-learning, machine learning techniques, or natural language processing capabilities. Uh, now I will show three use cases, how we've helped uh, uh, companies making the first steps uh, by developing and implementing uh, an advanced analytics tool uh, that supports them, generally speaking, and making fast fact-based decisions and also running, also running what-if what if scenarios. Okay. Yeah, the first one was a case uh, from a fashion manufacturer, uh, uh, globally, globally active. Um, they were well, basically facing um, uh, facing the challenge to to make better sourcing decisions. So they would like to make better fast sourcing decisions to solve the factory utilization, uh, but maybe more important uh, to be able to deal with the current challenges. For example, now uh, now the lockdown in Vietnam it had a huge impact on their on their sourcing uh, sourcing landscape. Uh, the challenges they were facing uh, in the old, in how, the, how they were doing it in the old way, um, all the decisions to factories were made uh, uh, using a manual process, uh, tribal knowledge, uh, uh, using tribal knowledge and Excel, uh, resulting in a suboptimal output. Um, uh, so it lacks implementing de-risking constraints, it lacks scenario planning, and it was also very, very time consuming. So together with them, with the teams, we built an analytical scenario planning tool um, uh, with results to well, improve factory utilization, uh, increase flexibility, reduce time spent to make, to make the full plan as well as short term and long term uh, and a reduction in cost. Uh, furthermore, it also gives more visibility into cost and in well, the capabilities of, the, of their partners. Um, and well, actually, what's I think yeah, quite great that we can now really include all the de-risking constraints. So you can think about, for example, no, no supplier can have more than 30% of the total units or a certain percentage of the total units must be allocated to strategic suppliers or a certain percentage of total units um, um, yeah, must be, must be co-located. So the the garment factory and also the fabric mill must be located in the same region. Um, so by yeah, including all these de-risking de -risking constraints and still having an optimal feasible plan, uh, they can now really yeah, make steps, make steps, uh, make steps forward. This is just, this is one example. Second one was for a brewery, Heineken, um, very our, Proud Dutch uh, uh, Dutch brewery company. Um, we work together with them to build a what we call a brewery capacity model. Um, it's a cloud-based uh, strategic decision support tool uh, for production capacity to give updates for the capacity of the world 
and to manage their investment as optimally as possible in short. So they had a very clear objective. Okay, we would like to answer any capacity question over the world within a few clicks. Um, again, they, uh, they were using uh, an Excel, Excel model. It was built 10 years ago by an intern. Uh, they did well, great work, but yeah, Excel is Excel. Um, so it really squeezed the juice out of Excel and well, they were not able to manage the investments as optimally as possible uh, with this, with this error prone tool. And it was really a huge effort to report on global level. So then they were receiving like 20 or 30 different Excel files and then they had to combine everything, etc. cetera. Um, so together with them, we, we built uh, we built this well, decision support tool. So uh, uh, all the all the counters in the world, they have access to the tool, they can log in, they can upload the data. And in the headquarters in the lens, they have a total uh, total overview. Uh, so now they are better, yeah, now they can better assess when it makes sense uh, to make capacity investments. They can postpone CapEx uh, as a result of this tool, sometimes millions of euros per year, simply by allocating production capacity in an, uh, uh, in an optimal way, and they better understand where they need to ask uh, uh, production support from, uh, from, other, from other operating companies in order, for example, to prevent, uh, to prevent loss sales. The last use case uh, I, would like to, I would like to share, uh, we work together with, uh, with Arubus. Um, Arubus, uh, for more than 150 years, Arubus is producing copper, uh, copper and other metals. The company well, uh, considers itself as a real multi-metal provider. Um, and their objective was to manage the complexity uh, in the production portfolio, uh, planning the entire uh, primary copper supply chain, considering all the technical restrictions and commercial constraints. Um, so in recent years, the uh, uh, challenges came up like because like that uh, the complexity of materials is increasing and that yeah and at the same time uh, the technical processability and the associated added value of every step uh, need to be determined even faster uh, to be able to respond uh, uh, to respond to the uh, to the market market environment so with this uh, integrated value based uh, value based planning model um, well, it's increased revenue uh, based on continuous portfolio optimization, uh, workload reduction, uh, and a joint workflow for purchasing and production, production, production planning. Uh, so this, yeah, this tool, this model is currently used in supply chain management to support uh, value-based production planning and purchasing decisions. Um, these are true ex three examples, uh, all different industries, fashion, heavy industry, F&B, uh, global large companies. Um, but don't get scared by, uh, by the global large companies, right? So uh, we also do a lot of work in the Netherlands for the very small companies. Already in a few weeks, uh, if you have the mindset, if you would like to uh, uh, invest uh, people and if you would like to um yeah to to set up a project to to try to see what's out there how can analytics help you in making smarter faster decisions etc um yeah please please give it a try i would all uh, invite you uh, uh, to do it also the very large companies it's not that they're only doing large projects so for example this fashion manufacturer they define projects of six weeks. They say in six weeks, we would like to see results. If not, then we start another project. Uh, if we see results, then we, then we continue. Um, well, this is what I, would like to, what I would like to share. I can, I hope it was a bit in 15 minutes. Um, um, if there are any, any questions, please, please reach out via, um, via the chat or the, um, and then uh, yeah, more than I will try to answer. Um, thanks all. Thanks all for uh, for letting me have this. Uh, uh, for letting me telling telling our experiences um, and the story. Thank you, Peter.
for your presentation. It gives me now the honour to invite our next speaker, Mr. Bart Bring, Global Program Director of Digital Twin of Royal Huskington DHV, to give his presentation on how they can help you to realise a sustainable industry. Uh, Mr. Bring, please. Thank you. Um... Let's put up my slides, make sure that it works. Uh, Excellency, President of SMF, and of course, uh, welcome all attendees and an honor to share with you the next 15 minutes uh, more about the topic of digital twins, demystifying, and how they help in realizing a sustainable industry. And I think my story will really align to one of the comments made by the President of SMF in his opening talk about the importance of sustainability and the adoption by SMF of the Sustainable Development Goals. But before I do, a little bit about myself and my context. My name is Bach Brink. I'm uh, working for Royal Haskell in DHV for 16 years and I'm currently heading up our global digital twin program across all sectors and regions we operate in. A little bit about the company context, helping you to understand which perspective we're talking from on the slide positions. And, and we are celebrating this Friday our 140th birthday eh, as a company. So we are an employee owned company being around there for quite some time, also in the Asia region and also in the industry uh, with a strong footprint uh, in industry in, across multiple sectors. What is important next to our heritage and what we have been delivering for our clients over, over time from an engineering consultancy practice and was a lot about designing and optimizing factories and other and supply chains for that regard, is that we extended our, from a strategy, our, our organization or capabilities with digital and digital services. And in that area, uh, the digital twins is really for us a strategic topic where I want to elaborate on with you today and share not only what that concept is about, but also how to get going with it and share a couple of examples, but focus from the lens of sustainability. Okay. Digital twins can be also applied from a productivity perspective, from a, a, a supply chain resilience perspective, as Peter already elaborated on, but my focus will a little bit more on sustain, sustainability angle and how they come in there and can help you to be sustainable on the short and longer run. And that's, that, I think, the, the lens we need to look at this, this topic as well. I think on the left-hand side, you see the by now well-known sustainability development goals. And if you review them, you see that there are quite some SDGs mentioned that relate to how we deal with the physical environment around us. It's not only about sustainable cities and communities, but also, of course, how we deal with water, how we deal with energy, and how do we uh, change the way we organize our value change and supply chain with minimal impact. And finally, climate. Eh? Climate impacts uh, our, our industries have, how to deal with them? How do we deal with the pressure that goes to that? What is the impact on climate change on our supply chain? On the other hand, you see on the right-hand side that the, the way we organize our physical environment, and whether it's sites, whether it's supply chains, whether it's factories, whether it's buildings, etc., there isn't a continuous need to better use data. Not only on the left-hand side shown on the right-hand figure about how we uh, manage the physical environment eh, by operating, it's by monitoring and control using data and optimize it. But we also see that we increasingly use data and information in the way we shape that physical world. And the uh, imagineering uh, by using scenario analytics, etc., already in the design process. And the crux and the importance is that we start using data collected in operations, also back to CAPEX, and start closing this infinity loop of continuous innovation. So I think there's an important need to better eh, connect and close and use data in the way we shape, build and optimize the physical environment around us. And in that regard, digital twins come in. So what is then this concept of digital twins? And uh, let me position it uh, in a couple of sentences using this slide. I think most important to, to, to share with you is that the uh, digital twins is for me really a concept. It's not a technology in itself. It's being viewed by technology, but the essence of a digital twin is that it gives us a virtual replica of the physical situation for two purposes. One purpose is to understand the physical world, to know what's happening at a certain moment in time, but not only to visualize it, but also give meaning to it and to analyze it and say, hey, there is happening something, there is an alert or etc. 
So I think that is one purpose of the digital twin is to capture data and describe it. And that is where a lot of applications of digital twins are today. But I think that's not the only purpose of the digital twin to understand what's happening. Uh, yes, it gives you insight, it gives you information and it will show a use case later on to elaborate on that. But more importantly, there is a second purpose of digital twins and that's really shaping the physical world or supporting decision making about how to adapt the physical world in the best way. And there you get into more advanced versions of digital twins, which is really about prediction. What if I would change the setting in this machine or change the layout of my factory or change the setup of my supply chain? What if yeah, simulating predictive prediction is really in there? And on the other hand, it's about prescribing. Yeah? Can software models, data models, information models, resource models help us to provide alternatives, advisors on what we can do best? And I think that's not per se new. Right? We have been using simulation models and the like for ages. But what we see increasingly through the establishment of these kind of data-driven systems like digital twins, um, we increasingly do that more data-driven and, and are better to validate our assumptions using these vast amounts of data. And that brings me to the last part of a digital twin. Right? So as a decision support to us, the second purpose, in the end, change something in the physical environment again. Uh, and change can be done automatically, machine to machine. But in a lot of cases, it will be still be done yeah, by human intervention. Yeah, humans use this, yeah, the operators, uh, managers in the factory environment can use digital twins and their, their data and insights, models and advices they provide to make the better informed decisions and change settings in the physical world again. As I said, digital twins are not, in my view, a technology per se, but it's really built upon all kinds of technologies. And that's also one of the reasons why we see an emerging emerge of digital twins in the market because all the technologies outlined here are getting more affordable are growing in quality are being more and more adopted and we increasingly see more the business value of doing so and so this showcases a little bit of a couple of technologies you apply or use when you go on a digital twin journey and you build a digital twin of an asset system or supply chain or site um, one element I briefly want to touch upon is the ER, VR element. Uh, it's about virtual reality, extended reality, yeah? so create a kind of uh, 3D view on the, what's happening in. In my view, it is an, it is an important potential add-on of a digital twin, but not per se. Uh, a digital twin is not per se about that 3D representation. In a lot of cases, it's really useful to have an understanding of what's happening, but sometimes just a simple dashboard can do the job as well. And so it, Okay. This most important message here is for digital twins. Technology is fueling it, it's making it possible. But I think digital twins, in the way described in this presentation, are really a concept that brings that together. You can apply digital twins in all kinds of areas. And of course, digital twins are and have been out there for quite some time already, but often focus on, on equipment level or production line level, and where we collect data, where we monitor performance according to certain KPIs, we get alerts when we see deviations from it, and we use uh, simulations and AI tooled algorithms to predict or optimize the setting of the production line. But increasingly, we see that digital twins go beyond that, not focusing just on the production line, but start looking at site level, at supply chain level, at country level not only in collecting data and showing it, eh, 3D representation of the uh, virtual Singapore is a good example in that regard, but also helping you to optimize and predict, and especially if you go to sustainability for water, energy, this is important and needed because it's complex. Eh? There are a lot of factors that play a role in how you deal with energy, eh? especially if you add renewables to the mix, if you become part of smart grids. And their digital twins really come in to help you to manage the data, get the relevant insights and get the relevant answers to manage your business. Last but not least is the one on the right hand side, climate resilience, which I think next to sustainability is a driving force is climate change. And also from that perspective, it is an impact how climate will impact your supply chains, flood risks, etc. And one of the areas we are heavily focusing on from IHDHV, from a knowledge about flooding, flood forecasting, coastal protection and the like, is digital twins for climate resilience and how to deal with that. And in that regard, we did to, uh, we uh, acquired a company, I took a majority interest in the company, to say it rightly, the Hydraulic Institute in Singapore two, week, two months ago. 
And there are a couple of challenges though, if you start talking about this topic of digital twins we need to look into. And one is about data. Right? Data is important, but it's also the challenge to get the right data, the quality of the data. Have I access to the data? It doesn't sit with my OEMs or with my, my suppliers. How, what kind of agreements did I made about it? And most importantly, what is relevant data? It's not about big data. It's about data you want to have or need to know about to make the best decisions. Secondly is interoperability, which means how do you exchange data in the best way? With a factory environment, but also across the supply chain with multiple stakeholders. And the development of standards and the and language, how we exchange that data is an important topic in the market out there, which we need to find answers to. In my view, personally, people and culture are the most prominent and most challenging one. Because in the end of the day, yeah, we're not just replacing human factors with technology. No, we're enhancing peoples and experts with technology. And to do this, so they need to be educated and be upskilled in doing so. And so the whole human capital side, training, educating people how to deal with this new technology and get trust in it, is crucial. So it, Digital Twins is also part of a, a change program. It's not just implementing a solution, it's a change, it's a transformation. Security and privacy are always out there, especially when you move beyond just asset or factory level uh, on one end. So if you get more to systems or systems, collecting multiple systems in a kind of ecosystem. Uh, but also if you do feedback into the machine, then it becomes critical that you are secure. And last but not least, problem or value versus tech driven. It all starts with what is my business question? What do I need to solve? What do I need to deal with? Where's my opportunity? And not with technology. Technology is just the means to a goal and help you to get to the right answer there. There are a couple of ways to start before I move to the examples. Um, one is kind of that top-down approach. Uh, I think every industry uh, is looking or need to look or started to look as have been looking into digital transformation and how data can help them to become more predictable, more resilient, more adaptive. And in my view, digital twins is a, can be part of that. It can be what we have been working for. A couple of clients is really work on digital twin roadmaps. Identifying what is digital twins means for you, your context. What are the steps to take on the journey? What are the guiding principles, etc. Another way is more bottom up, I would say. You have an existing operations. What can I learn from that from a monitoring control? Huh? Gathering data, analyzing data already have. And last but not least, and I think the increasingly more and more important opportunity is that when you start investing in capex investing in new facilities or really large brownfield developments take digital twin thinking as part of that journey next to right, not only the physical design but let's make sure that we design the physical and the digital environment in one go really integrated in one way to do so properly i think a methodology is required and I don't want to go too much in detail, but on the right hand side, you see a business transformation framework we have been developing, have been using for 25 years to help over 300 clients to deal with this transition, which really is, is bringing together, okay, what is what I want to achieve from a business perspective? What does it mean for how I organize my business? What kind of data do I need? And what is it required for technology? Not only to defining the plan, but also managing the portfolio of change that comes from it. Three examples briefly to say a little bit, okay, now sustainability digital twins, give me an example. And on the right hand side, you see a little bit what part of the digital twin is focusing on. Is this the first example is in the high tech uh, industry. And I think this is quite a common case, but still worth sharing. Uh, and common from a perspective that is all about collecting data, analyzing data and making it visible. And in this case, here we looked at a couple of items, uh, energy monitoring, service monitoring, regulation monitoring, utility monitoring. And just collecting this data and uh, making it visible through Power BI and dashboarding already gives insight about what's happening in a, in a complex environment like the high tech. It's sometimes easier said to do than done because one of the challenges is access to data and how you deal with all kinds of specific items in there. And so I think getting this foundation right and build up towards this dashboard of insights was already an important uh, situation in this context. And what it helped with is that it's, it gave not only the insights, but it also helped to better manage the business in that regard. Another one I want to share briefly is where we started not from the OPEX perspective, as the previous example, which went from the CAPEX perspective. And this was a new facility in uh, the UK where uh, Tyler wanted to build a new factory. 
And what we do in, did do in this, this case, is this instance, is that we not only designed the facility, but we modeled the whole business process in that facility using advanced simulation model technologies um, and our own in-house solution called Witness of a company called Lana we acquired a couple of years ago. And what we really did is that we modeled in the design phase already, okay, what is the way of working in the factory? What are the key parameters in that? And how can we align the design of the factory with the business process in it? And how can we de-risk? By using smart technologies like predictive simulation, we could de-risk the design, which helped in the end in getting a bankable business case. And we de-risk the, the capex, we made it smarter and more efficient. But we didn't stop there. We then took the simulation model, which is kind of a virtual factory environment, to We connected it to our data source in the ERP system of the factory. Not personally on a daily basis, but sometimes on a monthly or yearly basis. Last example I want to share, which goes a little bit more beyond on the right hand side, is Aquasheet. And Aquasheet is as in uh, and, and dealing with water and the quality of water and how we uh, predict the quality of the water in the systems. This software has been used also in Singapore. POB is an active user of this. Um, but also in industry, we are seeing an increasing need to deal with complexity of water, quality of water but also from a legislation and compliance, which is an important factor more and more. Right? Sustainability is not only about making the difference with your own business, but increasingly there is a compliance element and the need to explain what you're doing and how you are performing. And that digital twins comes in as this example shows here. So AquaSuite, which is really much more analytics and virtual operator of your wastewater treatment plan and related uh, assets to that, has been applied in this industry context, uh, uh, taking over the advanced control of the anaerobic reactor. What this example brought us was a couple of things. One is we had to deal with the fact that there was not always uh, sensor data available. So we introduced the, the concept of soft sensoring. Yeah? So moderating what we expect based on our domain knowledge about water, water quality, what the behavior of that situation would be. And so soft censoring is an important way to do so to get relevant data, back to my data quality point mentioned earlier. Secondly, we were able to do this in a continuous operation. So we didn't have to stop the water flow, the wastewater, having business continuity impact where we were able to continue within. We didn't have to do CAPEX, we could just do on top of the existing operation, start implementing this virtual operator, get better insights, start better manage the system, get more better insights in, from a compliance perspective. And at the end of the day, we saved in this case one to two million euros on the daily, on, on, on the yearly OPEX, which is a significant yeah. benefit for the company, uh, just on the water part of their operations in this food and beverage side, which is, uh, I think, a relevant, uh, relevant showcase. Now, having said it, to summarize my story in a couple of bullets, I think in our view, digital twins are on the rise. It's an important trend in the market and a powerful concept due to the fact that it brings together all these technology in a coherent manner. There are various ways to start from it. Take your digital transformation journey, yeah, top down policy, corporate level thinking, but also in operations or when you build a new facility or large brownfields redevelopment. It's important to don't see digital twins just as a digital twin or something or a pump or an asset, but see them more as a system which you gradually build up as part of your transformation and where you look into interoperability, security, how you take people alongside the journey. And I think some examples have showed that huh, led to better financial bankability in the hybrid Tyler case, brought down OPEX costs significantly. It led to business continuity huh, from a, a uh, you could, could do it without interfering with the business too much or the operations. And last but not least, an important element for sustainability is the compliance, being able to explain what your business is doing and how you're performing against SDG goals. Now, what we do and where we help uh, as a rounding off slide is that we have been building our digital business over the last couple of years, resulting to currently 300 people and uh, providing this suite of services, ranging from consulting helping clients with digital transformation, helping to build these digital twin examples like the, the high-tech manufacturing example, and last but not least on climate change and resilience related to flooding, 
climate resilience and uh, water treatment and predictive simulation also deliver our own software solutions to help clients do this and make the change and in the end realize a sustainable industry thank you for your for listening and um, i will review the questions in the q a and happy to answer them there or reach out based on the contact details, details on the screen Thank you, Mr. Bart Bring, for your interesting presentation. Now it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Edwin Garrison, business development developer of Demcon Smart Machine Base, to come and inform us about his flexible and modular platform for high-end production automation. Uh, Edwin, please. Hello, everybody. Let me share my screen. Give me a second. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to be a uh, part of the program today. I'm glad to be here uh, online with you. And it's good to see that many of you have found the time to, uh, to participate. My name is uh, Edwin Gerritsen. I'm a mechanical engineer by background. And I work as a business developer at Demcom Industrial Systems. And I would like to introduce you to our uh, smart machine-based platform that we developed in the last years. So I'll be coming from the uh, production angle in the, uh, in the presentation today. So maybe before we, uh, we start, a couple words on the, uh, on the Demcom group. Our company is active in, uh, in the area shown on the, on the slide. We do this by uh, developing, manufacturing, and supplying high-quality technology and innovative products. Our, um, our roots are in the semicom industry, where we started as a, a megatronic design house. Uh, we work for companies like ASML, KLA, Applied Materials, and so on as a development partner. Over the years, our business has grown into different areas. And uh, yeah, I would say that the development of medical devices uh, for third parties represents quite a substantial part of our annual volume these days. Uh, most of our engineering hubs are in uh, Europe, but we also have an entity and a small team in Singapore since 2018 that we use as a stepping stone into, uh, into Asia. For us, Singapore is a very attractive uh, place to be because there are a lot of innovative uh, companies in the semicon and in the medical industry for us to work with. I, uh, I personally work for the uh, industrial systems an automation business. So uh, let's take a closer look at that. So at uh, Industrial Systems, we, uh, we develop and create innovative production technology, which means that my clients are always uh, companies that are producing uh, products. So what does that mean? We, um, yeah, we deliver uh, uh, yeah, uh, custom production technology in four different market segments with the medtech being a very important market segment for us. Our experience there ranges from uh, yeah, high speed, high precision assembly systems to uh, end of line test systems, bespoke production machinery, inspection tools, uh, quality control uh, tools, uh, pilot production lines and uh, yeah, full volume production lines. Uh, yeah, everything that has to do with production uh, usually also with a lot of uh, volume, typically the products are uh, disposable to, uh, yeah, to have an uh, attractive business case for the, for the client. So what we, um, yeah, what we noticed in the, in the years of doing, uh, doing projects is that uh, yeah, there's a lot of commonality in the systems that we deliver. We always have uh, some sort of mechanical frame. We have doors, we have windows. Uh, yeah, uh, on top of these uh, generic functions, there are always sub-functions needed, like, uh, the, like the, 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 the safety aspects, electronic uh, power supply, uh, pressurized air. There's a lot uh, required to make a custom machine. And we use this sort of functional decomposition to come up with, an, um, yeah, with a standard starting point that we now use as starting point for our projects, both on the mechanical side, 
but also on the, uh, the software side. So this is our, uh, yeah, our smart machine base. It's, uh, yeah, it's a modeler platform that we use as a starting point for uh, yeah, automation projects. Uh, the modeler approach allows us to join multiple systems together uh, into a larger production system. Our clients can start with only a, a single module. We've paid special attention also to, uh, yeah, to have a good and smooth integration of operator workplaces if needed, so that we can also during the startup phase work with operators. And then once the volume has grown on the client side, that we then uh, replace that position by an, uh, yeah, an additional module. And then the operator is not working on individual components anymore, but then they can be responsible for, for loading and offloading the machine with complete trace. Um, yeah, we feel that the, this approach yeah, allows us to reduce cost, reduce lead time and increase quality uh, because we only have to focus on the client specific process. Here's another visual impression of our smart machine base. Like I said, it's available as, an, uh, as a standalone system, but also as a long production line. We've developed a standard white colored variant as well, in addition to the blue and gray examples that you see here on the slide. So the, um, in addition to the mechanical side of our approach, we also spend a lot of thought in the, in the digital part. These days, uh, yeah, production machinery comes with a lot of software. There are a lot of uh, uh, motors that you need to uh, you need to control. You need to transfer all the parts through the machine. You need to have an HMI to the client. You need to monitor and control everything that's going on on a um, on a machine uh, level. But in, in addition to that, we see more and more the need to uh, not only connect our machines to traditional software suites like a mesh system or an ERP system, but also to the uh, yeah, more online smart production services. So that's why we have uh, developed an, yeah, a cost effective reference architecture that we can reuse from project to project and improve so that we don't have to start developing software uh, from scratch. We, uh, we use a functional approach based on uh, S88 and workflow according to PACML standards for the, uh, for the people that might be familiar with that. And we have developed a standard HMI together with a group of users to ensure that we are displaying the, the most important data in a very convenient way. Our smart industry connections enable us uh, and the client to use the latest technology on predictive maintenance, smart quality control, and digital twinning. Uh, we are able to send the data to public and private clouds for monitoring, analysis, and control. So how is this going to help you? Um, with this technology, we can get more independent from the human experts that might have to do the, um, the evaluation whether or not a product is good. Uh, we are able to better handling the increasing system complexity that we see with advanced production systems these days. Uh, it gives us the opportunity and the clients to react in real time on the disruptions in the production and uh, especially for 24 seven operations. That's very important. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to optimize the processes and the operations, and it helps us to reduce the human uh, involvement, especially in remote and dangerous environment. All in all, it gives you a better product quality and a higher predictability. So what does this mean then in reality? Uh, I've brought two uh, cases with me on this slide. On the left hand side of the slide, you see a production system that we have uh, on order for a client. We are building this system as we speak in our workshop. It's a high speed, high precision fission, fission assisted assembly system that is used to assemble a uh, diagnostic cart that can be used for a, 
uh, infection detection. Uh, their technology is based on a uh, very small uh, microfluidicum chip that is made in silicium. And we are able to uh, take this microfluidicum chip, chip and assemble it in a uh, plastic test card with the required uh, uh, alignment precision. And we can do that very fast with cycle time uh, lower than three seconds. Uh, the system is equipped with laser marking to uh, write a QR code to the product. Everything the machine is done is registered in an electronic batch record. We have integrated uh, vision-based quality control so that we can proactively inform the client if there are issues with the component batches that are coming in. The system is clean room compatible and also very important for this client using the uh, uh, connectivity smart box of our software we were able uh, we are able to connect it to the client's software environment on the right hand side we see a different project this is a system that is used to uh, yeah to coat uh, um, needles and uh, catheters uh, and to apply an acoustic reflective coating to the to the product this uh, improves the uh, ultrasound visibility of the needle and it helps medical specialists to uh, yeah, perform procedures. And here again, it's very important that we have fully, uh, that we have a very uh, yeah, complete control of everything that's happening in the machine, that we are able to detect errors, that we check all the components that are coming in uh, visually and that we report that and document that in an electronic batch record and also connect that to the um, client systems. So, uh, yeah, with this, I would like to uh, conclude my uh, presentation. I trust that I've given you an, uh, yeah, an overview of our uh, yeah, capabilities and how we make the link to a production system and the, uh, yeah, all the new uh, technology that's available in the cloud with respect to, uh, to smart productions. So if you have any questions uh, after the meeting, then uh, feel free to contact me. As we heard from the three speakers, there are a lot of opportunities in um, Netherlands in areas of digitalization. More importantly, we noted that Netherlands is well known for its innovation as well as its technologies. So the country of Netherlands will be of interest to a great uh, many of our enterprises who would like to find out about how to do business and enter to Netherlands. So coming up now, it is my pleasure to invite uh, Ms. Adeline Tan, Area Di Director of Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency. She will present to you the important subject of how you can leverage on Netherlands as your gateway to Europe because of its many good um, incentives as well as its recognition as the hub for innovation in the EU. Uh, Adeline, please. Thanks, Amaline. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Thanks, Evelyn, uh, for the introduction, and um, great to have everyone in this session. Uh, so I'm Adeline, uh, representing the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency here in Singapore. Um, I think today's uh, webinar's uh, main theme uh, is really growth, and uh, I'm very excited to be able to be here to share with all of you uh, what are some of the, um, let's say, key decision-making factors that companies have when thinking about expansion uh, into the EU and they do it from the Netherlands. So a little bit about us, uh, I have been with the team for the last uh, 15 years. So I uh, would like to also really share some of the questions that companies have whenever they think about an expansion policy. 
The Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, we're part of the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy, so we're 100% uh, government. And what we do is to really assist you with uh, providing of information, connecting to networks. Uh, Pre-COVID, we do a lot of uh, fact-finding trips for companies, introducing them to um, the local ecosystem. Right now, of course, we're able to do that um, digitally. And uh, of course, as government agency, uh, our services are provided on a complimentary, confidential and no obligation basis. Uh, we're not able to engage in business development also because we work with a lot of companies uh, from similar industries. Uh, I think many of the companies here are very familiar with the Singapore Economic Development Board. So uh, on the side of the Dutch government, that's also what we do, uh, inbound uh, Netherlands work. So I'd like to uh, give you a bit of a snapshot uh, on the types of companies that we have assisted uh, last year. So um, to bring your attention, uh, in the midst of the pandemic, uh, we still had about 300 over uh, foreign companies or international companies choosing to locate themselves in the Netherlands for the European market. Uh, good to note that in line with uh, the theme of today's webinar, IT makes up a very big uh, sector for that. And of course, uh, the uh, sector of IT is uh, large. You have the fintech, um, even every tech uh, these days for the IT. And uh, I think very interesting to note that companies, uh, many companies are also coming from our region. You will see that uh, Asia ranks number three in terms of origin of uh, companies. So in terms of uh, working culture, uh, way of doing business, um, there is a lot of comfort and especially for the Dutch and the Singaporeans, uh, there's a lot of similarities um, like what the ambassador and also uh, Mr. Douglas Fu uh, earlier mentioned. This is a snapshot of some of the Singaporean companies that have already established uh, an entity in the Netherlands for their European operations. You will see a couple of things to uh, take out of these slides. You will see that uh, the companies range from uh, the medium-sized enterprises to the uh, larger corporates. Also, they come from very diverse industries. Um, you will see quite a number of maritime related companies. Uh, we have data centers in there. Uh, also companies dealing in the field of sustainability. So it's a very wide range uh, of companies. This list uh, is not exhaustive, uh, but we're looking at around 200 Singaporean companies currently uh, based in the Netherlands. So um, today I'd like to share uh, what some of these companies are thinking about uh, when they decide to actually set up a local team. I think in the last two years uh, with the pandemic, uh, it's easy to think that companies are actually scaling back uh, on their expansion plans. But contrary to that, uh, we speak with a lot of our current investors uh, here in Singapore and in the region. I'm responsible also for Australia and New Zealand. Uh, like what a lot of our previous speakers have mentioned, uh, logistics is a very big part of a business. Costs are rising. Uh, just very recently, we had a news article about the semiconductor industry. Uh, I think there, there's also a lot of pressure in terms of the uh, logistics supply chain. Um, we have seen and companies have also feedback that uh, teams that actually have local uh, establishment on the ground uh, have really done comparatively well the last two years as compared to companies that do not. So uh, due to the, the travel restrictions the last two years, companies uh, that do have local teams are really able to continue with efforts to meet with their customers and also to ensure there is continuity in uh, the business flow. So the six uh, unique selling points that we have are strategic location, international business climate, uh, good logistics, uh, infrastructure, uh, excellent cost of living, uh, ex excellent uh, quality of life, average cost of living, competitive fiscal climate, and of course, talent-wise, a very highly skilled, productive, and multilingual workforce. Now on paper, these six uh, points are actually also the points that a lot of uh, countries have. And I always say uh, the devil is in the details, so I like to go straight into them. So uh, you would know that the gateway uh, to Europe, uh, the Netherlands is very strategically positioned for that. What this means for companies is that you gain access to your clients uh, in as short a time as possible. 
And this is possible because of the strong infrastructure that we already have. So you would see that uh, Schiphol Airport, uh, one of the best passenger airports in Europe. Uh, we have the main ports of Rotterdam and Amsterdam uh, in the Netherlands itself. And of course, Rotterdam has undergone an expansion project a couple of years back. So uh, also able to receive uh, larger vessels. Uh, we see a lot of uh, developments ongoing to further enhance the infrastructure. The regulations support that as well. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a very efficient uh, Dutch customs. Um, some of you might know already that when you bring in your products uh, into the EU uh, via the Netherlands, we have a very good VAT deferment program, which is excellent for companies in terms of monitoring your cash flow. Uh, this is also the reason why we see um, a lot of companies with physical products uh, choosing to use the Netherlands uh, as their gateway. These days, we don't talk only about physical infrastructure. Uh, we cannot talk about connectivity without touching about uh, digitalization. The Netherlands ranks extremely high in that sense. Uh, this is supported also by the fact that we do have many data centers in the Netherlands. Uh, in Singapore itself, Capital T and T uh, owns uh, two data centers as well uh, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, speed of connectivity, stability, uh, the Netherlands uh, leads the way in that. Uh, this is also the reason why we have a very strong security cluster in the Netherlands. Uh, also tech companies that are able uh, to benefit from this digital infrastructure. Another aspect that uh, businesses think about, although having uh, is taxation, uh, although having said that, uh, a lot of them do look at the business case first, but it's also good to note that uh, in Western Europe itself, the Netherlands has a very competitive and tax neutral system. Uh, with Singapore, uh, we do have a lot of tax treaty agreements in place. And of course, one of them is the avoidance of double taxation agreement. Uh, companies also explore uh, using the Netherlands for their European activities. Uh, um, especially for the very positive and low withholding tax rates uh, we have in terms of repatriating of profits and dividends from the Netherlands back to the parent company here in Singapore. So uh, in terms of corporate tax rates, uh, we are also extremely competitive within the EU itself. Now, international business climate, this is something that uh, many people pay attention to. And uh, for this uh, study, I definitely have to highlight Singapore because Singapore comes first. But I think very good to note that uh, the Netherlands uh, is extremely competitive in Western Europe. Uh, what this means um, and what this translates into for companies is that the style of working is very similar. Uh, the speed, the response speed, uh, the way of thinking, the very straightforward way of doing business, uh, stability in terms of government policies. Uh, these are aspects that Singaporean companies are used to here. Uh, they can also enjoy that uh, in the Netherlands. So um, in terms of operating uh, in Europe, the Netherlands uh, is a very good platform uh, for that. Now, one of the uh, larger concerns that companies have when they are looking at expansion is always availability of talent. Now, um, in that respect, uh, it's not also only about the availability, but having the right talent on the ground. So in the Netherlands, uh, we rank first worldwide in terms of language skills. And what this means is that when you hire somebody in the Netherlands, and I think the rest of the speakers can attest to that, uh, um, everyone speaks English in the Netherlands. Also, it's very easy to pick up somebody who can speak uh, one or two other European languages. So what we see here uh, uh, in Singapore, uh, we do have many companies setting up their marketing and sales activities uh, in the Netherlands, uh, but of course with a much target audience, uh, including uh, key markets like Germany, uh, Italy and France, uh, but they are able to find the right talent in the Netherlands uh, to also handle these markets. So language skills comes in very handy. Uh, skilled labor is readily available. Uh, we're talking these days a lot about the technical talent. 
uh, one of the reasons why skilled labor is readily available uh, is also due to the fact that uh, the Netherlands is a very attractive location for talent to come to work and live in. Um, and this brings me to my next slide. Uh, we have a very good quality of life in the Netherlands. Um, due to the issue of Brexit, we have seen in the last couple of years, due to also um, topics of market access, uh, people moving even from the UK to the Netherlands. Uh, there's very good work-life balance. And uh, of course, this um, impacts the company's operation when you're looking to send uh, people from your existing team to work and live in the Netherlands. Um, so good to know that uh, quality of life is good. Cost of living is uh, remains average. Although I think uh, key cities around the world are seeing increase in, um, let's say, rents. Um, this is the same in Singapore. But overall, on a global basis, uh, it's still extremely manageable. So um, I hope this gives you a snapshot of uh, some of the aspects uh, that companies think about uh, when they uh, want to expand in Europe. And we always talk about Europe because uh, Europe is a big market, but for hub countries like the Netherlands, uh, we do have a lot of policies um, and also very good uh, ecosystem for companies to base and locate their operations in. Um, today, it's a very short session, so we could only present to you a snapshot. Uh, these are our contact details. Uh, we're always very happy to speak on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, with you, should you like to explore uh, further. Thank you very much. We have now come to the Q&A question. There are some questions and in view of time, I shall now ask my colleague to flash the questions and I will invite the panelists here to answer the questions that pertain to their specialty. So can we flash the questions? There are a few questions that have come out. Um, so the first question is, how can Singapore SMEs and Netherlands SME work together? Uh, maybe I can direct this question to Adeline to answer and the other uh, speakers to add on their views uh, later on. Uh, Adeline, would you like to yeah, answer? Sure. So how can uh, Singapore SMEs and uh, Dutch SMEs work together? I think uh, so far we have, what we have seen, uh, there are a couple of initiatives going on. I believe the EEN network uh, also presents a very good platform uh, to do that. Uh, we have seen um, a couple of examples. So this uh, is in the field of technology. So uh, we have seen Dutch companies tap on the expertise of Singapore companies and then coming here, uh, for the region and the other way as well, Singaporean companies are really working together with a Dutch entity um, and then working together with them to target the EU market. Now, a couple of things um, would be joint R&D. Uh, they're very good uh, incentives uh, in both countries to support that. So I think that's uh, one very interesting aspect that we are seeing uh, more and more companies uh, take up and explore. Um, so that's in terms of R&D, uh, joint ventures, we're also seeing more of that. So I, I, I think I would say uh, the ways and form are plenty. Uh, EEN presents an extremely good platform to also find out which are the companies in very complementary field and uh, skill sets as your companies. Uh, but I think uh, for any of you that do have a specific interest, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, NFIA, we sit within the larger embassy team, uh, so we also have colleagues dealing with different aspects and we'll be happy to see how best we can help you. How about the rest of the other uh, speakers? Would you like to add how your company can facilitate uh, the collaboration between the uh, Netherlands companies, SMEs at your end and Singapore SMEs? Any other speakers would like to add on their views? 
No, I think it, for my end, it's important to uh, mention that although the examples sometimes look from big, large companies, a lot of them, let's take the hybrid Tyler example in my case, are done with SME kind of companies. Huh? So I think there, the, there's not that digital transformation and digital technology in itself is limited to uh, only larger corporates. I think it's getting into the phase that um, best practices are getting there, huh? off-the-shelf solutions are there which makes the technology and the potential of the technology much more accessible to SMEs as well, as it was compared to a couple of years ago, still in its early days. And there was a lot of R&D unknown and not proven in it. And so I think when the market matures more and more, the market gets more open and ready and also available to the SMEs uh, uh, from best practices, off-the-shelf solutions, uh, uh, proven technologies, which I think from an SME perspective is really beneficial because that de-risks the the time they need to learn from it and adopt it. Okay. So let me go on to the question two. Okay, uh, somebody else wanted to, one of the speaker wanted to add something on, something to the uh, question one. If not, uh, let me uh, uh, proceed to question two, which is increasing your intermediate inventory increases your risk of capital consumption and stagnant cash flow. Wouldn't this increase your supply chain risk? Uh, isn't the centralizing a more viable uh, solution? And I shall ask uh, Peter to answer this question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Emily. Um, um, yeah, so we actually, uh, Bart and I, we already answered some questions um, during the, um, in the last minutes. Uh, it can be seen in the Q&A. Um, so maybe given the time, we can go quickly through these. Um, um, yeah, uh, correct. Uh, yes, uh, intermediate inventory, like, like any inventory, carries the risk of, of getting obsolete and ties up cash. However, the savings... Of those factors that have to be weighed so you have to be able to make a data driven decision uh, against the cost of uh, disruption uh, including lost yeah. revenues higher prices etc so um, by implementing a scenario planning tool uh, answering what if questions then you are really able to make this to make this trade-off um, so it is indeed the yeah the trade-off okay carrying higher inventory versus what if we have a disruptive event? Um, and are you able to answer these questions? Uh, yeah, these questions well. But I think we can, maybe Emily for the other ones, maybe we can focus on the open open questions given the, given the time. Okay, so the next question is, what stage in the transformation journey would you find most businesses today? Uh, who would like to answer the, uh, this question? One of the panelists, please. Yeah, I think as we both Peter and I commented on in the chat already, uh, essence it's quite scattered, um, and better companies are on the move, especially in the last two years. Uh, so in the last two years, you see increased adoption of digital and data, and they started the digital transformation, um, but also starting in various parts of their business. Uh, so it's it's often focused on administrative processes, on operational level, uh, increase the OEE level, start monitoring that. Uh. If you look to the more advanced versions like predictive and prescriptive, then it's really in the first steps. And there's a lot of buzz around it. But if you actually look at the real best practices that's growing, uh, the, the World Economic Forum publishes every year Lighthouse Project that is gradually growing. But I think it's still in it, uh, to be honest, digital transformation it, it's an ongoing transition and a lot of companies are still in their early days which is is what it is huh? um, so there's a lot of potential to gain i would say okay i think uh, i think the number four number five and number six you all have answered directly to the uh companies that have raised this which any of you would like to add on before i move uh, down this um Raquel, can you move the question further down? And further down to, to the audience. There is, and to answer this open question, there's one open question here. What are some of the biggest roadblocks that mid-sized businesses face along the journey of transitioning? Uh, that is from Singapore to Netherlands. 
Yeah, um, Emily, maybe I can take that. So uh, yeah. I, I think in the last uh, 15 uh, years of my time in NFIA, uh, talking to companies, uh, this is uh, one of the questions that we get a lot. So what are some of the largest challenge? Uh, you know, sometimes uh, companies think, um, is it the way of doing business? Um, the administrative part, very straightforward. Um, the largest roadblock uh, or obstacle, I would say, is really in terms of getting the right hire uh, in starting up the operations. And I think this is a lot uh, something that a lot of the business owners uh, would uh, hold very dear uh, to their hearts as well when you do set up a new operation. Um, I have seen companies succeed in and, and scaling the team from a five packs team to uh, let's say 10, 10 packs team uh, the next year. Uh, I have also seen companies start up with uh, two packs um, and then really not being able to uh, progress the next couple of years. The, the question then is, is it because of the lack of customers? Uh, is it the go-to-market strategy? Uh, but truth be told, it's always the first few hire that you have uh, in the entity. So uh, this is something uh, that we try and help companies with in terms of finding the right people on the ground through uh, uh, connecting you to local recruitment agencies. Uh, and also, uh, one of the uh, things that the Netherlands has is that we have a very good highly skilled migrant scheme or immigration scheme uh, that allows you to send people to work and live in the Netherlands. Uh, the so-called expats that you bring to the Netherlands um, for the first five years, they are able to get a 30% tax allowance deduction. Uh, so this is a bit the uh, uh, offsetting the relocation cost for an employee uh, from our perspective. So uh, talent, uh, getting the right people to start the company uh, in the Netherlands is uh, one thing that, that companies uh, should pay attention to. And of course, uh, another question that I get a lot uh, it's really a chicken and egg question. Should I have more clients before I set up an entity or should I set up the entity first uh, to get more uh, clients? This question uh, is, uh, the answer to this question is very unique to each company. But having said that, uh, the challenge is that if you do not have a local entity, in today's times, companies want to do business with people that they know even more so today because networking opportunities are limited. So it's very difficult to break into the market. Uh, companies, I have seen companies make the decision to set up the entity uh, in order to execute their go to uh, market strategy. A reason be being it's, uh, it's easy to set up an entity in the Netherlands. Everything is in English. Uh, the, the language uh, of business is English. So uh, we have seen companies take that step in order to execute uh, the go-to-market strategy. So I hope uh, this gives you a little bit of an insight, but I'm always happy to uh, continue the conversation after this session. Thank you, Adeline, and thank you to all the other speakers. Thank you very much for your presence here today. In view of the... Uh, we have overrun. So in view of the time, now I will now end the... Um, this uh, webinar. Uh, let's give the round of applause to all the panelists and the speakers. Can okay. as you can see from the um, this our program. Can you show the program to the all the participants here? Okay. As you can see from the program, if should you have any, uh, please show the program. Or oh, the contact details, um, Teresa or who? Teresa, please show the program. Just, if you can see, uh, I request all the participants take a look down. Follow up actions, please contact this email address. The other uh, email that you have uh, been given is uh, this uh, Adeline. No, Adeline, would you like to repeat the email contact that you have given in your slides? Um, yes, uh, let's, let's see. Um, yeah, I think if I share my screen, it will, it will block yours, but uh, you can all find uh, us on LinkedIn. 
or uh, just go to the website investinholland.com and you will see our details online as well. Okay, so there are two, uh, two uh, contacts you can contact. The embassy via uh, what uh, Adeline has mentioned, uh, the Facebook plus the Invest uh, Holland, as well as the SMF one where you will see that there's a global business. So we welcome participants to come and contact us. Uh, as mentioned earlier on by my SMF president, Mr. Douglas Wu, the SMF is uh, committed to help companies to uh, collaborate and work with Netherlands companies and we encourage all Singapore uh, companies to contact SMF because our Enterprise Europe Network will be very pleased to help you to find suitable partners uh, in Netherlands for your business. So without taking any further time, let me thank all the participants and all the speakers for your presence here today. Thank you, participants, for uh, uh, coming here. And we, as I may remain open to hearing from you. And we are very uh, pleased to be able to engage with you in this webinar as well as going forward. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Stay well and stay healthy. So I will now end the webinar. Thank you.